In this second of three lectures, we're going to be looking at sequencing applications. So taking a bit of a look at um, all those sequencing technologies that we explored in the first lecture and begin to see what you can uh, go on and do with that sort of data. So the big topics that really you want to take home from uh, the, the, the seminar today is that first uh, we want to explore a range of very different uh, case studies of next generation sequencing data and their applications. And they've been chosen, uh, again, just to highlight the breadth of things that you can begin to ask in terms of uh, biological questions. And then the second thing is that we're going to go into a bit more of a detailed uh, exploration, so a deep dive into de novo sequence assembly, because this is a major application of uh, new sequencing data. And so it's likely to be a topic that you're going to encounter um, in the future, in, you know, depending on what your career takes you. So we can ask, you know, what, uh, what can you use uh, high throughput sequencing data for? And really the question, or better question, is what can't you use it for? So you've probably already encountered topics like transcriptomics to figure out gene expression, metagenomics to find out what are the, the range of organisms that live in a particular environment, genome assembly, so getting a genome sequence uh, from sequence data. But there's all these other uh, uses that you can put sequencing data towards. So um, some of the more interesting ones are things like identifying DNA uh, protein interactions or identifying protein accessible DNA. Um, and also things like determining genome structure. So these are these are questions, especially those protein-related ones, that you might not necessarily first think of next-generation sequencing data as being particularly well suited for. So we're going to look at a number of applications to give you a bit of an idea about what these technologies can be used for, including some of these more edgy cases. The first kind of study we're going to look at is this idea of uh, ChIP-seq, which is a shorthand for chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. So this is a technology that allows you to um, figure out where a specific protein, such as a transcription factor, binds to DNA. And this is a, a common task, uh, especially in biological studies, where you're trying to figure out you know, what do particular proteins do. And the method is, uh, it, it kind of looks like this. So basically what you've got, uh, if we walk our way through this uh, flow chart, is that you start off with uh, your protein of interest, which is bound to the DNA. So this might be a transcription factor or just anything that really binds to DNA. The second thing you do is you, um, you, you fragment that DNA and then you, you pull down the protein together with whatever DNA is bound to it. And you can pull down the protein any way you like. Often it's with an antibody that selects for the protein uh, that, that you're interested in pulling down. The third step is to wash away any unbound DNA. So what you really want to be left with is DNA that is uh, bound close to the protein uh, that you're interested in, but all the other DNA you wash away. The fifth step is to sequence the bound DNA. Um, and this is just standard sequencing like we saw in our last uh, seminar in this series. And the fifth step is a bioinformatic one. So you need to work out where the bound DNA maps onto your genome. And if you do this, you get something that looks very much like this, uh, this sort of cartoon or the schematic. So here we've got an example of uh, three genes along a genome sequence, so genes one, two, and three, um, and a series of reads that come from this ChIP-seq analysis. And you see that there's a, a large number of reads that bind just upstream of gene number two. And so you might guess from this that whatever protein you were looking at is perhaps a transcription factor that binds to the promoter region of gene number two. Now it's important to note though that you can never get rid of all of the other DNA in your sample. There's always going to be a little bit that creeps through. And so you can see that by those other reads that map to the other genes or different parts of the genome. So these are kind of noise. But the key point here is that there's a whole lot of reads uh, that map in front of gene two. So it's pretty clear that there's an important signal going on there. <laughs> 
And here's a real example of what this kind of pattern looks like. So what we have here is an example of the, the FOXA3 protein, which binds upstream of the ApoA2 gene. And so that big, um, that big sort of black peak indicates a big bulk of reads that map just upstream of the ApoA2 gene as indicated at the bottom of this figure. So it's binding towards, you know, on, on the promoter region of the FOXA, uh, of the ApoA2 gene. And so this is the kind of pattern that you might expect to see. So you see those, those big black peaks, or if you look at the top, you see the, the reads that map to either strands. So there's orange reads and, and blue reads. Again, a big peak of them. But as you look to the left and the right, there's also other reads that that happen to be binding there as well. And so that might be an indication of some of the noise of these other reads that are perhaps creeping through into your analysis. So although it's quite unusual perhaps to think of uh, DNA sequencing as a way to, to figure out anything to do with proteins, it is actually quite a good way to figure out um, how you, or where proteins bind to particular DNA sequences. If we look now at, um, I guess, a, a similar but, again, quite different uh, application, um, again, a case just to indicate the diversity of, of ways that next-generation sequencing data can be used. So this is a, a method called ATAC-seq, which stands for Assay for Transposase Accessible Chromatin Using Sequencing. So if you remember back to uh, your sort of first-year biology, um, your DNA varies in terms of its openness. So bits of the DNA are open and accessible and can be transcribed. Other bits are tightly wound up and very, very hard to get to. And so what this ATAC-seq method does is it allows you to identify what are the accessible regions of DNA you know, by probing for that open chromatin. So what, what bits of the DNA are open and accessible and what bits are closed up. And the method works like this, and it's a little bit similar to the previous one, that you have your open chromatin and then your, your closed chromatin that's shown on the left of this figure. And what you do is you bind this, this TN5 transposome to that DNA. Now that, that particular um, entity or moiety only binds to the open chromatin. So if the DNA is all tangled up in a ball, it can't get to it. And so... Uh, then the transposome cuts the DNA, and so you end up with fragments of DNA, but you only end up with fragments from that open chromatin. And so what can this method um, tell you about? You know, how is this method being used out in the real world? Well, there's a whole lot of different applications. Just some of them are things like um, identifying uh, the epigenome of cancers. So cancers, as you will see in, in the next seminar, are really a mix of different tumors and they can have very different uh, genomic profiles, including different epigenetic profiles. So in other words, bits of the DNA can be bound up tightly in one tumor and maybe not in another part of the tumor. And so this kind of method, this ataxic, gives you a way of profiling all the sorts of uh, different types of cancers that might be present within a single individual. Another example is to identify different cellular subtypes. So again, it's a bit similar to that cancer example, but this one would be commonly used, for instance, with immune cells. So if you think of uh, the blood circulating around your body, there's a whole lot of uh, white blood cells in there, so immune cells. And those immune cells come in all sorts of weird and wonderful different uh, flavors. So what you can find is that different people under different conditions or at different times of your life might have different uh, proportions of, of certain immune cells compared to other immune cells. And this method will, well, it's, it's one method that allows you to determine, you know, what are the different proportions of immune cell types within a blood sample. Another example would be comparative epigenomics, and this is really looking much more uh, deeply into time. So looking at differences in the epigenome or the, the, the sort of the open chromatin and the closed chromatin, 
between different organisms. So in this case, between humans and chimpanzee, but it could be any sort of case where you want to compare two different uh, species. It might be mouse and rat, or it could be any sort of organism that you're, you're working on for a particular biological question. And the last example here is by looking uh, at enhancers. So uh, different genes are turned on at different times uh, during the cell cycle or during development of an organism. Um, and so what you can do is look again at how these genes and their, their enhancer regions are sort of turned on and off for different cell types, for instance, through a time course from, from early development uh, through, to, um, through to a mature state. So that last uh, cartoon we saw was really a, a very stylized way of looking at this. Just to get this across, what we're looking at here is an example of identifying different immune, uh, or not immune cell, different cell types. So what we're looking at here is single cell sequencing. Um, so sequencing of individual cells as opposed to a mixed sample. And then looking at what are the different um, ataxic profiles of that open close chromatin in, in those individual cells. And you can see that they've got these different colors splotched into this particular graph, and they just indicate uh, the proportions and amounts of different cell types within this particular sample. So you can see there's a whole lot of uh, muscle primary cells, there's some mid-gut cells in there, you know, hemocytes. Um, and this is very useful if you want to figure out, you know, what is a tumor made of, if it's a cancer state, if it's immune cells, you know, what are the immune cells that are circulating around the blood. So this kind of figure um, is very, very common. You'll, you'll encounter it quite a lot, um, at least in a, in a research setting and probably increasingly in clinical settings too. To switch now to, uh, again, another different case study, again, just to emphasize the range of questions that you can ask with this data. So this is a, a method called HI-C, uh, which is a uh, chromosome confirmation capture sequencing method. And basically what we're doing here is trying to identify the three-dimensional context or organization of DNA in the nucleus of a cell. So if you look at introductory biology textbooks, uh, we often see chromosomes represented something like this. So basically an X shape um, indicating the chromosome. But this is not really what DNA looks like if it's in a cell. So we've already seen, of course, that DNA is bound up, some of it's tightly bound up, some of it's open. And if you look at the DNA in the nucleus, it's really much more like this figure on the right, like a, a giant ball of tangled wool. Uh, you know, like a kitten maybe has gotten to a ball of, of string and it ends up in this really interesting tangled three-dimensional state. And so a whole lot of things are, that are really critical to biology, you know, when genes are turned on and how they're turned on and which genes are turned on and which are turned off, uh, come down to this three-dimensional structure of DNA in the nucleus. So DNA in the nucleus is compartmentalized in a number of different ways. So if you think of it quite a large scale, different chromosomes have what are called different territories. So they like, they kind of like sitting in different parts of the nucleus. So, you know, in this figure on the left, you know, the, the green chromosome tends to be down the bottom and then the, the, the dark blue one tends to be up the top. You know, and that kind of pattern, uh, this very big scale pattern, tends to hold true uh, often across conditions. But as you start going deeper and deeper and smaller and smaller scale, you find other patterns too. So there are these things called topologically associated domains, or TADs, which are little bits of DNA that interact far more than they do with other bits of DNA. And then if you go down even smaller scale, you find this really interesting pattern of uh, sort of expression neighborhoods. So here we've got this um, a, a loop or a couple of loops of DNA, and they're held together by these things called uh, 
cohesin, so these rings, these protein rings that kind of the DNA loops through. And if there are genes in this particular region, uh, it means that you can turn on a whole class of genes all at once, or perhaps turn them off all at once. But basically, you can have this kind of expression factories or expression environments where certain genes are turned on and off just because of their, their three-dimensional um, orientation within the nucleus. So how do you actually go about uh, doing this kind of analysis in the real world? So uh, the critical thing is that if you're going to be looking at the 3D arrangement of DNA in a cell, then you've got to be working with living cells. So most of the other methods we've talked about uh, have often been using um, non-living cells. So a lot of methods you can just use with extracted DNA. This one you've got to start with living cells. Um, and the first bit is to cross-link the DNA. And you often do that in a fairly brutal way by using formaldehyde. So it just covalently links DNA that is um, physically adjacent in, in three-dimensional space. You then uh, cut with a restriction enzyme, and it doesn't really matter which one, but what you want to do is you want to break this DNA up into uh, much smaller fragments. So you don't want really, really long stretches of DNA. You just want covalently joined bits of DNA that are not uh, particularly long. So that's uh, as shown in kind of the second part of this entire image. And then you have to get this DNA that has been cross-linked. So what you do is you, you once you've cut with the restriction enzyme, you can fill in the ends and you can mark it with biotin. And then you can ligate those ends together. So this is a really um, a common trick with restriction enzymes. Right, you can get them binding together. So now what you've got is basically a um, uh, a loop of DNA where two bits of DNA, so the blue bit and the red bit, um, are now covalently joined together. They've been ligated together. Um, but they don't necessarily come from adjacent bits of DNA. They might come from two different uh, chromosomes, for all we know at this point. And then you can pull that DNA down. So you can pull it down using um, that biotin uh, marker. And then again, you share it up into very small pieces. And so what you end up with is uh, something like the far right of this figure with a single uh, stretch of DNA that contains two original bits of DNA, so the blue bit and that kind of ready orange bit, um, that may come from two different chromosomes. And then we just sequence them. So again, the sequencing is nothing particularly special. It's just uh, the same kind of sequencing that we saw um, in, in the last a seminar in this series. And then what you need to do is you, you have to map these fragments back to the genome, right? And so what you're doing is you're trying to look for the two ends of that DNA fragment and see, do they map close by? Do they map to pieces in the genome that are very, very far apart? So in this high c method, you often, well, you always really find that uh, the two bits of DNA are often not too far apart in the genome. So you get what is called this very, very strong diagonal, right, which indicates uh, that your assembly is good, but also indicates that most of the DNA fragments come from bits of the DNA that are closely adjacent to each other. But then there are these other patterns that are really, really interesting. So you can begin to see, as you move away from the diagonal, bits of DNA that are further apart in the one-dimensional genome that are interacting with each other. So in this particular case, we're looking at bits of the DNA that are either are repeat rich, as shown in that bottom plot, or are gene rich. And if we look on the, the heat map, then the blue regions are indicating lots of contacts between two different bits of the genome that are repeat rich, whereas the red bits or the red arrow is indicating a bit of the genome, or two bits of the genome that are, have lots of genes, and they are interacting. The black bits are indicating regions with much fewer contacts. And so in this particular case, there are very few contacts between the repeat bits of the genome and the gene bits of the genome. So this is a way to just get a bit of an indication about what is that three-dimensional structure 
how do genes and other bits of the genome um, behave in this three-dimensional space? And if you had a particular gene of interest, you could then go and look at you know, what other bits of the genome does that particular gene interact with. So the cases so far, we've really looked at a number of uh, different case studies and uses of next-gen sequencing technologies to answer different types of biological questions. Uh, but we've looked at them fairly, fairly lightly, just to give you a bit of a flavor for what those methods are and just the diversity of ways in which this data can be used. At this point, we're going to spend a bit more time and delve in a bit more detail into one particular application. So this is de novo sequence assembly. So this is where um, you have a genome of an organism that you have never studied before. You know, it might be the panda or a poodle. Uh, and you want to be able to take the DNA from that and sequence it and generate a new genome sequence. So the de novo bit means that you're doing this from scratch. You have no prior information to build off. All you've got is a DNA, and from that you've got to piece your small fragments of uh, sequence reads together to try and build up a genome sequence. And this has been really, really powerful, particularly for non-model organisms. So a lot of the, the major genomes uh, were sequenced in, uh, in other ways using older technologies. So for instance, uh, the human genome, but also mouse and rat and, and various other things like that. But of course, most of the biological problems out in the world involve organisms that aren't commonly studied. And so we need to have this way of sequencing their genomes as well. If you're interested in this question uh, of genome assembly, there's, there's a number of uh, things you can look up um, to get a bit more information. This is a paper that's quite interesting by, um, by Jared Simpson and Mihai Pop, just looking at what they say is the, the theory and practice of genome sequence assembly. So uh, if you're interested in reading up a bit more about it, this is a paper you might want to go and take a look at. There are a number of different methods for assembling genomes, and uh, we're going to be looking briefly at three of them today, but really focusing on, on one of them in particular. So the first technique, and here we're going kind of from easy to hard, so the first technique is a so-called read layout method. Um, and this is probably the one that you think of automatically when you think of genome assembly, as we'll see in just a moment. The second method is uh, a method called the overlap graph, um, which is a bit more complex, but um, kind of one step on from the read layout method. And then the third method, which we're going to look at in much more detail, is uh, the De Bruyne graph method, which again uh, uses graph theory to try and piece bits of the genome together. Um, and it's a much harder method to understand, but it's very, very commonly used. It's quite a powerful method and so it's quite uh, useful to know how it works. But before we get there, it's perhaps worth looking first at some of these more simple methods. So the first method we want to look at is this idea of, of the read overlaps. And this is uh, probably what you think of when you think of genome assembly. So what you've got here at the top there in black is um, the complete genome sequence of this bit that you're trying to assemble. Now, we, we never have this, of course, but it's just up there to give you a bit of guide to what we would expect to see. And then the, the, the reads below it, the four sequences below it, are individual reads that we have sequenced. So we have taken the DNA, we've, we've broken it up, we've sequenced it, at, and we've got these, these small sequences of, um, of the DNA. And what you basically do is you look for overlaps. Okay, so read overlap, the, the, the trick is in the name. You look for overlaps between the reads. So we see uh, the first and the, the second read overlap with G-A-T, G-A-C-T, and then the third and the second read overlap, and the fourth and the third read overlap. And so once you've got these overlaps, then you can start straight from the left and just read off the sequence by moving from left to right. 
So that's fairly straightforward. This is almost certainly the method that you automatically think of when you think of genome assembly. And indeed, this is a commonly used method. So when the human genome was assembled, it was assembled using read overlap methods. So you might ask, well, why don't we do this all the time? And there's a few reasons for that. The first is that uh, this particular method works uh, very well if you've got uh, small data sets and very, very long reads. Um, so the human genome, of course, was done with Sanger sequences, which are quite long. Uh, and so this method was quite uh, useful. But the approach is much less successful when you've got uh, short read data or where you've got very large data sets or if you have a lot of repeat elements in your data set. Um, it must be said that this method is undergoing a bit of a renaissance uh, with long read data. So now that you get some very, very long reads with PacBio, lots of nanopore or other technologies, uh, some people and some assemblers are, are going back to this read overlap method. And possibly that's the way things will go as that long read data uh, becomes more and more common. But because short read data is still very common and is likely to remain common in the near future, it's important to know that this method doesn't really work and we need to consider uh, some of the others. So the other method that we should consider is this one here called the overlap layout consensus method. And this is very similar to the previous one in that you take your reads, which are indicated here on that upper left figure, and uh, the colors just are a way of allowing us to sort of indicate how these reads are related to each other. So what you do is you do an overlap. So you basically say, how does every read uh, relate to every other read? You know, does it overlap or does it not? And how well does it overlap? And so you identify the overlaps, which is indicated in the next part of this figure. But then the method changes. So instead of just saying, well, the reads overlap, so we're going to read them from left to right, uh, you instead build a graph, so a network structure that indicates how each read is related to the other reads. And once you have this, you walk through that graph. So there's a special path through this graph called the Hamiltonian, which is the shortest path. So there's lots of very, very long ways of going through this network, but there's always one shortest path uh, through the network. And so what you do is you, you kind of look at uh, those red arrows and indicate, right, the, the green read kind of goes to the light blue read, which goes, kind of goes to the, the dashed read, which kind of goes to the purple read. And so you then walk through your graph structure, uh, reading off the sequence and the joins, and from that you get your finished product, your consensus sequence. So very similar to the overlap method, uh, but a bit more um, perhaps mathematically aware and a bit more capable of dealing with some of the complexities of real biological data. So this brings us to the third method, uh, this idea of uh, de Bruijn graphs. Um, so these are yet another step away uh, from those very, very simple methods. So they're, they're much more complex and they are harder to understand. And so you might be tempted to ask, well, you know, who really cares? Why, why is it important to look at this? And uh, unfortunately, we do have to look at it because these De Bruyne assemblers or assemblers that use this De Bruyne method are used all the time, especially with short read data. Um, and so uh, we need to have some idea about how they work. Okay, so, so why is this? Well, De Bruyne graphs, so it's admittedly a bit of a challenging concept to wrap your head around, although we're going to give it a good shot and walk through it um, in the next few slides. But just before we get there, it's important to perhaps ask, you know, why, why learn this in the first place? So De Bruyne graphs are really the only method that work in practice for short read data. So uh, this, this approach will work even on very, very large data sets. And increasingly, when we get sequencing data, we have a lot of sequencing data. 
So those other methods that we looked about earlier, uh, just practically, they don't work. Um, and because short read data is still very common, uh, these De Bruyne maths graphs are likely to be in use for some time to come. So the hope is that uh, as we get very long uh, read sequencing, those overlap methods will come back at some point, but uh, that's really for the future. That hasn't happened uh, just yet. Okay, so let's, let's walk through De Bruyne graphs and try and get an indication about what's going on. So again, at the top here, we've got the sequence that we want to assemble. So in the real world, we'd never know that. But this is just a bit of an indication of what we're going after so we can, so we can understand the method. And then you, you have reads um, that you've sequenced off that larger sequence. But, but here's the first crazy bit. Although your reads are already they're very, very short, the first step in the De Bruyne method is to break them up even smaller. So we take the reads and we break them up into these things called kamers. So these are, uh, sometimes it's called words, and they're of a set number of nucleotides. Um, invariably, they're um, an odd number. So in this particular case, um, these particular kamers are seven. So in other words, you take a read and you take out every um, unique sequence of seven nucleotides within that read. And so here's just an example of a bunch of seven mers or seven uh, you know, kamers of size 7 uh, taken from this particular sequence. You know, and here's another example. So here are some formers. So this is perhaps a little bit easier to just to see for a teaching perspective. So you take your sequence, um, you break it up and you, you generate your reads. Then you take those reads and you break them up into these smaller fragments, uh, this, kind, this time of, of size uh, 4. And then the trick to De Bruyne graphs is that instead of looking for overlaps between the reads, what you're looking at is um, overlaps between the kamers. Right? So not overlaps between the reads, it's overlap between the kamers. And particularly we're looking for n minus 1 overlaps between the kamers. So, um, so kamers that overlap exactly except for one nucleotide on either side. And what you do is you get this graph structure of these kamers that overlap. So you've got, um, if you look at the sort of the top line here, the first kamer is TGAG. The next one is um, ATGA. The next one is GATG. So these are overlapping kamers, right? And so what you can do is you can walk through this graph structure and just read off the sequence. So in this particular case, the sequence is AGA, TCC, GAT, GAG. Now, of course, biology is never that simple. And so there's always these other things that you've got to take into account. So basically, you've got to fix problems and you've got to correct errors. So the two main errors that tend to come in with this particular method are the first is um, sequencing errors. So the sequences are pretty good, but they always have some uh, level of error rate, which means that um, there are going to be mistakes in this graph structure. So if you look at the, at the kind of the top of this figure, there's this thing that's called a spur or a tip. Um, so a little arrow that comes up but then doesn't go anywhere. All right, so you've got to recognize those and remove those from the graph structure. And this, the second thing here are these, these kind of cycles or these circles. And these often indicate repeat regions, um, particularly small repeat regions. And so... Um, you have to figure out what's going on there. So you might have a particular uh, repeat region, imagine a transposon that's just repeated um, in a line over and over and over again. Um, if the sequence of that transposon doesn't change, then it will appear as one of these cycles in the graph. Okay, so let's, let's just work through this again um, kind of just step by step. So here's uh, a, just a toy example. Again, that's a sequence that you see at the top, um, which you wouldn't know. 
but it's there just to give you a bit of indication about what we're going for. And then we're just looking at that first little bit um, underlined there in the sequence and trying to get uh, see if we can reconstruct that. So we've got kamas of size 4 and you can see by the way it's shown on this figure how they overlap. So the first re sorry the first kama and the second kama overlap by GAG. The second and the third kama overlap by AGG. The third and the fourth kama overlap by GGC and so on. All right? So these are examples of where the kamas overlap except that it's an n minus one overlap, right? So there's one nucleotide on either side that doesn't overlap. And once you've got this graph structure, you can just read off the sequence. So you can start at the top and go C, G, A, G, G, C, T, T, right? So you collapse the graph down to the sequence. Here's another example, just to give you uh, a little bit more of a look at some of the complexity that can creep in. So uh, let's start looking at uh, the sequence on the left. All right, so here we've got uh, two reads. So let's just look at the first two reads for now. So you've got uh, TTAG, and that overlaps with uh, TAGA, right? So those two reads overlap. Uh, the kamas of four, and they overlap by N minus one. No problem. Um, and you've got that sequence elsewhere in the sequence up above as well, right? So if you look to the right, that pattern is exactly uh, repeated. So you've got two kamas uh, that overlap, TTAG, TAGA. But then we've got two different options. So if we look on the left, what can you do there? So the next one that's going to be um, joining up uh, as a kamo is AGAT. Right? And then below that you've got GATC, right? And then if you look on the right hand side though, it looks different. So here you've got G, sorry, A G A G, G A G A. So what this indicates is that there's a split in the graph. So as you walk along the sequence, you can you can assemble the first bit of the sequence just fine. So T T A G A. But then there's a question about where do you go from there? Is the sequence then T C? or to the sequence then GA. And this may or may not be resolvable. So um, if you had uh, longer reads and so you could get longer kamas, then maybe you'd be able to resolve this particular problem. But if you've got a, a large repeat element uh, that's been repeated multiple times in tandem, then it's possible that you could never resolve this situation. So again, this is a case where uh, reading off the sequence using kamas is, is quite easy if you have nice, clean, unique sequence. If you have repeat elements or other complexity going on, which of course is what typically happens in biology, then it can get a little bit more complex. All right, so that was a, a very brief introduction to De Bruyne assembly. Now, are you still confused? Well, uh, I'd be a bit surprised if you weren't. And so here are sort of three solutions if you really want to learn a little bit more about this particular approach. The first is that uh, this paper by Zubino and Bernie, so this was put out in uh, 2008, and it describes the method implemented in a particular piece of software called Velvet. Um, this it depends really on how you learn. So this particular paper is actually very, very good and it describes the method very well. Right? So if you want to sort of look at this, I would suggest getting pen and paper and start drawing out some of these k-mas just to see if you understand really how they work in terms of joining together in those n minus one overlaps. If you learn in different ways, there's this paper by um, Compo, Pevsner and Tesla. Um, which gives a slightly different and perhaps more gentle introduction to De Bruyne graphs. Um, again, I'd strongly suggest that you get pen and paper and start drawing out some of these De Bruyne graphs just to get into your head, you know, how this particular method works. And the third approach, if this is the kind of thing that you're into, is to uh, go and listen to this video by Ben Langmead.
Uh, so it's up on YouTube, and he describes the De Bruyne graph method. Um, he describes it in a, in a way that's a little bit different to the way I have, and so if you haven't understood my description, it's possible uh, that you will understand uh, the method that, uh, at least in the way that Ben describes it. So today we've traversed a lot of territory, so what should you be taking home from the seminar? So there's, there's really a few points that I think are worth uh, really thinking about in a bit more detail. So the first is that um, these high throughput sequencing reads, they're used for, for much more than just sequencing. So it's very tempting to think of sequencing as uh, getting the genome assembly, and indeed we have focused on that today uh, to some extent. But as we saw earlier, they can be used for so many other things. They can be used to figure out gene expression. They can be used to figure out uh, the 3D arrangement of DNA in a nucleus. They can be used to figure out where proteins bind uh, to DNA. So uh, they've got a lot of uses. And increasingly, you will find that sequencing is used in all sorts of applications where you may not immediately uh, think that it might be. The second point is that uh, these short read sequences are an incredibly versatile data source. So there's been a tendency perhaps for people to think that now that long read sequencing has come along, that these short read sequences might just disappear. Um, that could be true in certain applications. I could very easily imagine that happening in genome assembly, where long read data is just incredibly useful. But the short read data is still very, very useful in a whole lot of other applications. Um, including most of the ones that we looked at earlier today. It's not going to disappear, so it's still really important to know uh, how it works and what you can use it for. The next point is that uh, genome sequencing is becoming really widely accessible. With the, with the cost of sequencing going down, it means that even quite poorly resourced scientific groups can now sequence the, uh, the genome of the, the organism that they study. And so you will often be looking at genome sequencing and genome sequences for, for um, all sorts of weird and wonderful organisms, depending on your biological question. And so the question is then, you know, what can you do with all of this new biological data? And that's going to be what we explore in the third and last lecture in this series, where we're going to be looking at comparative genomics. So today, just to emphasize, uh, there is a huge range of uses of next generation sequencing data. Um, short read data isn't really going to go away, even if long read data becomes more and more common. But this kind of data set is going to be uh, in use all the time, and it's increasingly being used in all sorts of biological settings where you wouldn't automatically think um, of next generation sequencing data. Uh, as being an obvious go-to. So keep an eye out for it, um, and it's really important to know what some of these applications are and why they're so important.